All right, let's take you back to our very first story tonight, where five governors who call themselves a G5 uh, had a meeting. Of course, they're doubling down on the issue of are you res resigning? This is the PDP family. Even between us and our wives, we fight at times. But I've shown solidarity to our colleagues. Today we are launching PDP campaign in Benue and this PDP governors. In spite of the seeming differences that we have, we will not do anything that will undermine the authority and the leadership of the governor. At the same time, we will not do anything that will disgrace our son, who is the national chairman of PDP. Very hopefully, we believe that there is nothing that God cannot do. PDP is no school here in Denver State. We have no problem. By the grace of God, we shall win our election. We have been winning and we will win and we shall win again. Joining us now is Frank Tietier, our Rise News analyst. And uh, uh, from our offsite studio, we do have Somna Sambo, who is our Rise politics editor. Thank you so much, both of you, for being on the news tonight. In no particular order, uh, I'd like to begin with the so called G5 PDP governors. Somna Sambo, what do you make of this situation in the campaign season? How is the PDP likely to campaign in those five states? Are we likely to hear the top to bottom, bottom to top campaign slogan in those states? And, um, I'd like to state that what's happening, it's a very big challenge. <laughs> and um, we hope that the PDP will easily resolve its crisis because it's becoming a big challenge for our voters. And then it's leaving a lot of people confused in the states that uh, this crisis is ongoing as to what they are supposed to do when you see for example the national chairman of pdp not being present in his home state of benue where this campaign was taking place and these g5 governors were all present there he had to send a deputy to go there and so it's such a big challenge because if you believe in the electorate confused there members of the party wouldn't know what to do uh, but I can tell you that it's really costing the party a lot because uh, members of the party All right, are, are seem just... to be having uh, challenges with uh, Somna's audio there. We'll try to fix it as quickly as we can. Uh, Frank Tete, let me come to you right here in the studio. Well, <laughs> oh, Tom, the governor of Benue State says, look, Atiku stands no chance to win in 2023 without the G5 uh, governors. I wonder if you agree with that. And it looks like the die is cast. I mean, these governors are frontally going against Atiku. What do you make of it? I don't have to agree with uh, Governor Tom on that. As a matter of fact, uh, that is the situation. When five powerful governors of uh, a, a, an opposition party like the PDP that is struggling, uh, that resolute against it, there is uh, indeed the presidential candidate of the PDP would not stand a chance in 2023. Uh, the, these governors seem to be commanding a lot of uh, support in their home state. Some of them are also interested in uh, contesting the same election that is happening on the same day with the presidential election. So mm. they can actually adequately control uh, those uh, persons who that they influence to vote them and not actually confuse them by, by getting them to vote uh, for the particular personality like Atiku Abubakar that they are so staunchly against. 
uh, where we've said it enough, it's now stereotyped that this is a replication of the karmic uh, uh, effect mm -hmm. of what happened to Good Luck Jonathan led by Tiku Abubakar. So it becomes so interested that uh, it is happening too soon, too quickly, that uh, the, die, the, 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 the die is the, cast. Yes, and they decide mm -hmm. the other side of the coin, which we thought would take some more time, and which we actually thought that Atiku Abubakar could really get away with. It seemed to have been caught in the web of well, really, uh, how forgiving politicians like uh, the, five, the G5, the prominent yeah. G5 now. How much of a heavyweight, really, are these G5 uh, governors when you uh, consider their, you know, uh, political currency in terms of translating to votes? Oh, well, you don't want to talk about the, you don't want to put in doubt the influence and power of a personality like Governor Yeson Wiki, who controls an oil restraint. Uh, recently, he's been doling out money. He dashes money in court to <laughs> fellow governors. And uh, with, with that kind of personality, who who thought to himself secretly that he should have actually been the presidential candidate of the PDP, uh, that is indeed a, a heavyweight politician. That he, the River State, has accounted for quite a large number of votes to the credit of the PDP, and uh, he's not only influential uh, in River State, but across uh, the, the politics in Niger Delta and uh, national politics. He is indeed a heavyweight. And then you go to the southeast, and you know, let's just even co come to uh, the PDP chairman's home state, uh, where autumn has been blowing quite uh, hot uh, in Benue mm -hmm. State. And, and uh, that becomes a real problem because the PDP chairman is supposedly, expectedly, uh, to deliver his home state. But in this case, it's quite unlikely. So these are not very good times for the PDP. Mm. Okay, uh, we have been told that uh, we do have Sumner back. Mm. Sumner, we do apologize. We lost your audio for a bit there. Yeah. And you were responding to my question on how easy or difficult it would be for the PDP to campaign in those five states. I wonder if you want to land on that before I ask you my next question. I said it will be very confusing to the electorate because we've seen, uh, you know, uh, people who uh, had expected Benue State to traditionally be a strong ground for the PDP facing challenges. Its supporters there are in a total disarray because, I mean, the national chairman coming from the party wasn't present at such a mega rally where he had all the senatorial uh, 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 House of Rep candidates, the governorship candidate, and uh, it, it sends a lot of mixed signals that the national chairman, Yoche Ayu, coming from that state wasn't present there. And so it looks like uh, PDP is going to uh, face tough times. And with the growing influence of the APC governorship candidate in the state, including that of um, the Labour Party candidate in that state, I can tell you that it will be pretty difficult for PDP to be able to maintain a solid ground. But unfortunately, uh, we can see that even Governor Samuel Otto is one of the senatorial candidates. So I wonder how he will survive the onslaught that may happen if indeed he's mobilizing against um, the uh, PDP national, uh, uh, PDP presidential candidate, uh, and yet his own candidates will all be there. And so it's a very tough one. And uh, of course, I, I don't know how the uh, uh, supporters of PDP will look like there because they are all in quandary as to what exactly is happening. And of course, uh, in uh, Senate climbs, uh, uh, it, it may have been leading to, you know, uh, party elders coming together, but we are not seeing party elders, especially in the PDP, the, in, in Benue State, there used to be a very strong PDP stronghold before 2015. And of course, when Governor Samuel Oton came back to the PDP, we thought that, uh, you know, after his APC sojourn, a lot of things would go well, but it's so unfortunate with what's going on in that state. Well, let's stay with the PDP, so now, but to another issue in Zamfara State, uh, the court has, for the second time, nullified the quest for the PDP to have a candidate in that state. They failed, among other things, to give the required seven days notice to INEC for that primary. Is it that the political parties do not read our law books, they do not know the law, or they just don't know how to be democratic in practice? What's going on? Politics. When you politicize every aspect and people are so interested in um, not following processes but wanting to emerge without knowing that, yeah, I mean, procedures are set in place to guide uh, people and institutions on how to behave, uh, the court will always be there as arbiters to help out. I mean, this is exactly what happened at the APC, uh, that almost every candidate in uh, the APC uh, were swept away by the courts in Zamfara, only for the PDP not to be learning the same lessons. And of 
course, for the second time, the uh, court is uh, nullifying, you know, this uh, uh, governorship primaries of the main opposition uh, party, which is to be the uh, former ruling party until uh, uh, Governor uh, uh, Bello Matawale had to defect, uh, you know, to the APC. And so it also has to do with how the party at the national headquarters behaves, because we have thought that uh, the national chairman will be able to be involved in all these issues to resolve it, especially after that uh, initial cancellation. But with this happening, uh, you can see, like I said sometime last week, with that of the issues of River State, I mean, this is the issue of internal democracy, the story of internal democracy in almost all political parties, lack of failure to obey the rules. And of course, once you don't obey the constitution, uh, the courts will always be there to whip them to line, and that's what we are saying. The absence of failure of internal democracy, it continues to play out whether you're talking about the governing APC or the PDP. Well, somebody seems to be uh, set to gain uh, from this judgment. But my point, the finality of this judgment on the part of, uh, you know, uh, the um, Justice Aminu Bapa of the Federal High Court in Gusau, any options for the PDP? Well, it will always explore the option of going on appeal, but it is clearly in breach of the provisions of Section 82, Subsection 1, and Subsection 5. Uh, you see, we make a big uh, mistake when we, t when we think politics is everything. No, politics should be founded on law and not some form of recklessness like we find that is taking uh, holding sway. And that's the reason why we play down the role of legal advisors in these political parties and many of them don't even, they don't even bother to appoint them and if they appoint them they appoint one politician who does not have the time to read, in bet uh, read between the lines uh, of, of the new electoral act that is actually changing the culture of uh, politics, electoral politics in our country. So until we realize that to attain justice they need to, we, both all the authorities and persons according to section one of the constitution must actually play according to the rule and they must be uh, operate under the rule of law until that happens the courts unfortunately unfortunately and painfully mm. will continue to determine who gets elected in this country and that will not be democratic indeed so for 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 a party like the pdp not to know that there is a provision that you must give a certain amount of notice particularly section 82 subsection 1 talks about 21 day notice and it doesn't care and it doesn't matter whether INEC replies you or not and INEC may show up and it uh, may decide not to show up it's not it's not your concern as a political party but that provision is sacrosanct and then it went further in subsection 5 to say look if you don't give that notice to INEC whatever you do in nominating any candidate will stand invalidated I mean that's express and you find political parties in this time and age you know flagrantly disregarding that provision it shows you the kind of quality of persons who want to govern us and why would we continue to have all this retrogression and instead of making progress when you find people that can't even read express provision of a law and they go against it thinking that they yeah, I mean, the unfortunate thing is that they will tell you that it's not a judiciary. We can have our way. We can always do what we they always do. But things are changing. Times are changing. And mm. unfortunately, the PDP is going to weep indeed in this because in that particular judgment, the judge was that brazen to say, look, yeah. PDP, you haven't given a candidate in this election. I mean, that was going too far indeed. Mm. But yeah. that shows you how, how offensive the PDP action was. Especially okay. after having held the primary twice. Yeah. Mm. So now let's take this together because I think they're both related to campaign and campaign season. On one hand, we have uh, the campaign train for the PDP moving to Bruno uh, tomorrow, the Meduguri state capital. On the other hand, we have Ebola Tinubu of the APC uh, visiting the former president of Nigeria, former head of state, IBB. Uh, what do you have to say to these two things? And I want us to speak about Bola Tinubu, who has been visiting uh, unlike what we are seeing in other political parties with rallies, walks, you know, town halls, and all of that. What are you making of all of this? Well, I'd like to say uh, uh, that uh, uh, Bolatinobu is trying to redefine the political scene within his own uh, spectacles. Uh, and um, we've been seeing him moving around, meeting with some of these uh, top uh, decision makers, influencers, opinion leaders, former military leaders, because he just feels that, uh, based on what his spokesperson has said, that he feels that engaging with people directly, one-on-one, uh, -on -one will help to sell his message faster and not 
engaging in uh, uh, the sort of uh, media town hall meetings like uh, the one arise uh, embarked upon or uh, debates that th those may not necessarily lead to the sort of aspiration that he's uh, thinking ahead of 2023. And so, well, uh, this is actually, you know, giving me some goosebumps considering that in the past, you will see that uh, Tinubu doesn't really share any major form of ideology with this sort of military leaders. I mean, if you know, if you follow the trajectory of Bola Tinubu and the school of uh, politics that he comes from, you know that uh, the antithetical forces with uh, the Babangidas of this world. So when you see himself going uh, to, uh, uh, you know, Mina to go and meet with Babangida, I think twice now and then of course you even see uh, people like Peter will be going there uh, you begin to wonder what sort of politics we actually play in because I mean this same military uh, leader was demonized in the past and of course someone like Bola Tinobu during the June 12th struggle castigated Babangida using all these newspaper media houses and everything you know hitting him hard now going to solicit for you know his support is something else and, and the interesting thing is that we haven't seen Atiku doing this is it that Atiku is still carrying over what happened you know between 2010 and 2011 when there was that call for Northern Consensus leader and he was actually preferred the preferred Northern Consensus candidate and uh, you know Babangida had to step aside during that PDP presidential primary. Is, it th is that the reason why Atiku hasn't been going to Babangida? Because I'm wondering why others are going and he is not going. But in this instance, like I said earlier on, it questions the kind of credentials that Bola Tinbu himself is bringing to play when in the past you uh, uh, you know, criticize the same leader over and over, telling Nigerians how bad he was an anti-democrat, uh, council June 12th and all of that. And every now and then we see him kotoing to him uh, at that hilltop mansion in, in uh, uh, Mina. It has to say a lot. Well, just going to the other issue that you raised very quickly. I think Abubakar being in Borno State, well, it's going to be a big challenge for him because the APC presidential, vice presidential candidate comes from that state. And of course, PDP has never won Borno State. It's always been either APP or, of course, APC. And so it's good for him to go and fight for the votes there. And uh, we hope that he will be well received, uh, considering that that's his uh, geopolitical uh, uh, zone. And Atiku Abubakar, as a former customs officer, had served, he had worked in uh, Borno State, uh, served there, I think, as uh, customs administrative officer. So, well, he still has a lot of uh, uh, followers and some people who have been following his politics there. But Borno is a, a, a no, it's not a playground for the PDP. It's actually a playground for the APC. I mean, over the years, Borno and Yobe has always been inaccessible to the People's Democratic Party, either as a ruling party or as uh, an opposition. Okay, so let's uh, unpack it again. Still on the issue of Tinubu visiting IBB again, I'd like to add again. Uh, Frank Tietje, recall that in that interview uh, with Arise, talking about the IBB interview with Arise News, he actually made a point that the next president of Nigeria will be in his 60s. The next president to take over in 2023. Well, we all know that Tinubu is way above uh, 60s. What do you make of this repeated visit? And what Somna said, that it seems to be uh, a coalition of, you know, uh, coming together of strange bedfellows for want of a better expression. What do you make of that? And PDP's chances, of course, in Borno State. Any smart politician who understands the politics of, it, of the establishment will realize that there are power blocks that need to be placated, that need mm. to be appealed to. We're talking about a military president in the person of uh, Ibrahim Babangida, who actually uh, played the politics of loyalty in the army, in the military generally. He has die-hard loyalists. All persons mm -hmm. who go down to their graves preferring to die for IBB, even while they were in service and out of service. Uh, these persons are now, maybe many of them are retired. They command a lot of uh, influence. They command resources too that can influence elections. Look at them. Many of them contested elections in the wake of uh, our democratic uh, uh, opening. Mm. Uh, so these are the persons. So when you visit a figurehead like uh, Ibrahim Babangida, you're actually acknowledging that the, the power and influence of that block uh, which, he, which he represents, and that's the military. You can't take, away, take it away from them. Apart from the, the kind of politics we play now, 
Nigeria's history has been more defined by the military more than anything else. And there is this mystique that uh, the IBB carries on. Uh, you know, this Teflon idea that nothing really sticks onto him. He now appears to be a saint. Even no matter how much you claim to demonize him, everybody runs to him. The good, the bad, and the ugly, they all run to him to get endorsement. And then he tells everybody that it's all fine. So he makes predictions. Doesn't mean necessarily that that's the person he's going to support. But I, as a university student, we were fans of, we were, we were fans of IBB because we thought he was quite courageous. And he fought for the unity of this country in the way and manner. He put together the two parties system and established it I made all that decree. Apart from that inexplicable June 12 issue, Babangida actually uh, cuts the person that cuts the image of a northerner who loves the South a lot. Right. And then it means that unity, issues of unity are more settled with his personality. But all of these persons, like Bola Metinubu, who cannot in any way reconcile, after they uh, reconcile all the, their troubles with Babangida, suddenly going to meet him, only establish the fact that Babangida holds one mysterious power in our politics. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good place to live it. Somna Sambo, politics editor, Arise News, and uh, of course, uh, Frank Tete, Arise News analyst. Thank you both, gentlemen, as always, for joining us on Newsnight.